right, let's open our Bibles. <clears throat> Excuse me. Open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. And let's read the last five verses of this chapter, verses 10 through 14 today. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, uh, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Verse 10 is the second time the Lord has compared Christ's ministry to Melchizedek's priesthood in this chapter. He did earlier in verse 6. 18-year-old um, Mormon missionaries who say they hold the Melchizedek priesthood are flattering themselves to be like Jesus Christ even if they don't know it, which they are not. But Melchizedek is mentioned here because God has just given a universal offer of salvation, uh, both Jews and Gentiles, uh, as Melchizedek showed up before there was any distinction being made between Jews and Gentiles, in Genesis chapter 14. And he says up in verse 9, Unto all them that obey him. Let's review what we read last time, back in the book of Romans. Go back to the book of Romans, chapter 1, first of all. Romans 1. And let's notice, first of all, verse 5. Romans 1, verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Jump over to Romans 6. Romans 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Jump over to Romans 16. Romans 16. And verse 26. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And then back to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? The forgiveness of your sins, the saving of your soul, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in your body are all accomplished. They all come by an act of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ um, in the church age. It's called obeying the gospel. There are some uh, ultra hyper Calvinists who think that if I respond to the gospel I decide to trust Christ as my Savior because I know I'm I'm no good on my own that somehow that constitutes work on my part work to um, achieve salvation or to attain it it does not constitute work it constitutes obedience mm -hmm. And there's a marked difference between those two ideas. Um, depending on water baptism, in order to get the Holy Spirit, like the Church of Christ teaches these days, uh, is disobedience in this day and age. Amen. All of those things come by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone by faith. And anyone who says that um, there's something more I have to do afterwards to add to it, uh, is stating that the death of Christ and 
simple faith in his shed blood is not sufficient. And that there's something more that you're qualified to add. If the Son of God, the perfect Son of God who spoke and the, all of reality came into existence, isn't capable of saving me by his own efforts, who am I to add to it? Amen. That's right. Who do I think I am? That's right. right. And yet, when you put it in those terms, it, it shows the, the arrogance of people for what it really is. But, um, so the, <laughs> the invitation is to as many as received him, like John 1.12 states, or here, unto all them that obey him. Speaking of Melchizedek, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say. Most of these things are recorded later in chapter 7, but they don't really amount to many when you get right down to it. Paul says that the trouble in uttering them or speaking of them is with the audience. There's something wrong with the listeners. Um, he says they are dull of hearing in one verse here. It's kind of like the um, politician who was campaigning uh, for election and uh, a white guy, and he's in a heavily black district, and he's giving a campaign speech, and he says, although my skin may be white, my heart is just as black as yours are. <laughs> Which isn't a compliment, it's an insult. But he didn't mean it that way. And um, knowing audiences these days, they probably wouldn't take it as an insult because they're not educated very well. All you have to do is listen to them on the internet. People, everything's OMG and LOL and emojis for this, that, and the other. And nobody knows how to use punctuation, capital letters, uh, spelling, Please. everything's spelled wrong. And uh, yet that sort of dumbed down uh, way of communicating, uh, everybody engages in it. Those of us who still regard proper spelling, you know, all the characters are there on the keyboard on my cell phone. Right. I try to use them just to practice, you know, writing correctly. Where the comma goes and don't forget a period at the end. Yeah, maybe it takes longer for me to send a message than some of you all. But uh, at least mine are legible. So mine are readable. And, um, <clears throat> but... We appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, sometimes the, the problem is with the listener, the hearer. He hears a certain thing and then takes offense at it. That's the problem with uh, millennials or generation XYZ or whatever they call them nowadays. They're idiots. Yep. Their parents should have been shot before they reproduced. <laughs> See, I don't agree with that kind of talk. Well, you're not paying attention. You don't regard certain things as still being important in society. But uh, when everybody gets offended and upset, uh, how many saw the article online the other day about people offended by the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special? Yeah, because they're having an impromptu uh, Thanksgiving dinner in the backyard, and the one black character, uh, Franklin, he's sitting on one side of the table in a lawn chair, where, where presumably the others are all sitting on... Uh, regular chairs on the other side of the table, and uh, I don't think the artists or the writers intended to offend black people by portraying all the kids that way. They're fictional characters for crying out loud. Why would you take offense at it? Yeah. But people do. People do. And uh, like I said uh, some time ago, if you're one of these snowflakes who's triggered by everything that upsets you, you're not safe to go out in public. Right. Let me know when you're going to leave the house, I'll stay indoors. Because you'll be triggered at a red light when you want to, when you were hoping for a green light. You'll go berserk, you'll go out of your mind. But um, go back, if you will, to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. <clears throat> Let's read there verses 26 and 27. Saying, Go unto this people, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, 
and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Also, uh, go to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, <clears throat> and verses 7 and 8 there. Romans 11, verses 7 and 8. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Both of those texts are um, <clears throat> describing literal, actual Jews who, uh, because of pride, uh, would not hear the gospel being preached by the Apostle Paul that included Gentiles as well. The Jews had a very exclusive um, mindset about themselves and their standing with God, thinking that all of the commandments, all of the sacrifices, all of the ordinances in the tabernacle and then later the temple uh, would uh, earn their way into heaven or into paradise with God. And when the Lord Jesus came, and suffered for sins, and most of their nation rejected him. And then the gospel was then preached to not just the Jews, but the Gentiles and whoever, whosoever will. Uh, and Gentiles were embracing it, and Gentiles were seeing their lives transformed, and the blessings of God coming to them. Um, and the Jews were provoked to jealousy. Uh, it hardened their hearts even more. But both of those texts are aimed at Jews, who ought to have uh, heard, but instead were dull of hearing. Now at this point in our, in our text, we encounter sort of a, a mystery of, of sorts, a conundrum that needs to be resolved. Verse 12, for when, the time, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, notice the dual nature of the audience here in the book of Hebrews. If this ye and this you, like verse 12, ye have need that one teach you, if the ye and the you of that verse are the same as the you mentioned later on, notice chapter 6, verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, uh, though we thus speak. If that's the same you mentioned in that verse, then the audience can be taken to be saved New Testament Christians. And you can make great spiritual application to the growth of a new Christian. Um, but they're about to be told that their milk stage, when we talked about meat and milk in our the sermon time, and Paul mentioned it again in our text, that their milk stage is not sufficient to keep them from being cursed one day. Look at chapter 6, verse 8. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned, but, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and uh, which, which goes contrary, the idea of the suggestion that a, a New Testament believer uh, could lose his salvation because he hasn't grown uh, deep enough in the Word of God, goes against everything the Apostle Paul wrote in the rest of the New Testament about the security of a believer. <clears throat> but... Um, and, they, and they're said to be babies who are still drinking milk when they should be able to eat meat by now. And, you know, the diet of milk is illustrated uh, later on, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, as being the doctrine of Christ, uh, repentance from dead works, and faith toward God. The principles of the doctrine of Christ would surely include his virgin birth, his sinless life, his deity, his miracles, his death, burial, and resurrection. So what, what could the meat possibly be? And um, another, a couple of other questions that come up in this passage. Who are the Hebrews who ought to be teachers by now? Who is Paul describing? Who is he addressing? And when he writes, let us go on unto perfection, chapter 6, verse 1, us who? And it's impossible to apply such to apply such 
uh, passages of the Bible doctrinally to a New Testament church age believer. And they're going to have to fall upon a Hebrew who finds himself in the tribulation after the catching away of the saints, who had, had 2,000 years wow. of the gospel being preached. Wow. He still didn't embrace it, uh, neither did most of his ancestors, and the church disappeared, and here he is now. You know, every day you live as an unsaved person and reject the gospel of Christ, which somewhere along the way you clearly understood what it implied, what it required, and what it asked of you, and you reject it. That's one more day for which you're going to give account when you stand before the Lord Jesus one day in the great white throne. And um, to think that Jews for dozens of generations for 2,000 years worth um, refused to receive the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as the forgiver of their sins and embrace him as their Messiah of their race. Um, some did, a few did along the way, but by and large, most Jews do not re receive Jesus Christ. They still reject him. And that's sad to think about, a, a race of people, an identity of people uh, to whom God came, uh, among whom God came, and to whom he uh, promises to be their Messiah one day, and yet most of them still hang on to the religion of their, and the traditions of their ancestors, and refuse to admit them that they're sinners and need the forgiveness of the Savior. <clears throat> There's a great um, ministry, and I, I just now thought of it, so I don't quite remember. One for Israel, or something like that. Uh, they've got some great videos of uh, Jews who have received Christ as their Savior, giving their testimonies about how orthodox they were, how religious they were brought up and raised uh, to believe in the history of Israel, and they were confronted largely with Isaiah 53, the suffering um, servant described there, and none of the explanations of the rabbis as to who that person is seem to satisfy them. And then a believing Jew introduces them to the Lord Jesus Christ and how he fulfills that passage. And many of them say that that is a turning point, that that passage of their own scriptures they can never understand, never could reconcile until someone equated it with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. <clears throat> the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And uh, so they couldn't reconcile those things. Uh, but there's some great testimonies you can find online by this ministry of saved Jews um, operating in the state of Israel, leading other Jews to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. But um, <clears throat> he says they need to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God, verse 12. Why would they need to be taught these again if they already knew them? In chapter 6, verse 1, uh, they're told to leave those things behind and move on and grow. And like I say, this is a, a tricky part of the Bible to um, negotiate and they navigate your way through. Verse 12, such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now here we can make some remarkable spiritual and devotional applications for our own needs. And we talked about this in our preaching time. And by the way, I didn't plan that these two uh, <coughs> lessons would overlap each other. It just happens that way very often. Uh, but a baby needs milk. Um, and I think I mentioned in church that Manuel's new baby, Genesis, she needs milk right now. She's not ready for a carne asada burrito with jalapenos. On. <laughs> I'm 57 years old, neither am I. <laughs> but, um, but that baby needs to grow by the, a new Christian needs to grow by the milk of the word of God. <clears throat> and uh, he should be trained in testifying for Christ openly, not be ashamed to tell someone else, listen, I 
trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you that's made the biggest difference in my life uh, of enti my entire lifetime. I was six years old when I got saved, and that made the biggest difference in me. Um, and I've often said I've been a sorry Christian many times, but I've never been sorry that I was one, yeah. nor have I ever doubted that I was one. Yeah. That day is the most prominent uh, memory of my early childhood. Uh, but a new Christian needs to be trained in praying um, memor and maintaining fellowship with God. He needs to be trained in reading and memorizing the Word of God. He needs to be trained in gathering with other Christians to hear the Bible taught, hear the Bible preached together, in daily judging himself and confessing any new sins that come to mind. He needs to be certain of Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead, and his promise to come again. He needs to be solid in, about those things. He should seek to live right, to live clean, to do right, to live properly, and, and he should understand that he has two natures that are now struggling within him. He has a new nature that wants to please God and serve God with his life, whatever talents and abilities he may possess, and he has an old nature that wants to just satisfy the flesh and the wants of the moment. The Apostle Paul describes all this, Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8, and he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this, the body of this death? And he says, the good that I would do, I, I, I do not, the, the evil which I would not, that I do. And the greatest Christian who ever lived struggled with those two uh, components to himself. You've seen it depicted many times in cartoons where there's an angel on one shoulder and a little devil on the other shoulder, mm -hmm. and they're each whispering in your ear. One appeals to your more uh, noble uh, nature, wants you to do something right and proper, while the other says, nah, cut corners, get away with this, cheat, do this, do that, the other. And the person uh, is torn between these two uh, directions. This is what tells us that the human, uh, the, the human being, the man or the woman, is made up of three parts. The body is the body, and it's being pulled in one direction. The spirit that's been regenerated by the Holy Spirit wants to please God and go in the other direction. The third part of you is the soul, and he's within those two forces, and he's got a daily decision to make. Actually, it's a moment-by-moment -moment decision. Will I, will I yield to the flesh and just do what feels good at the moment and, you know, tell myself I can apologize to God later for it? Um, or will I say no to that want, to that impulse, that need, to that lust, and do what is acceptable in the eyes of God? <clears throat> it's a struggle. You think, well, for the Christian, that should be a clear decision to make. It is a clear decision. It is a clear decision. And the Christian knows what decision he ought to make. But the flesh is strong. The flesh is strong. Uh, it's not only strong, but it's also weak at the same time. Yeah. And uh, that's another um, you know, mystery in the Bible, how the flesh can be both strong and weak simultaneously. Look forward at chapter Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that, that the heart be established with grace not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. The heart of a believer is established with grace, not with meats. It's the grace of God that saved you. It's the grace of God that uh, washed you clean from your sin. It was the grace of God that sent Jesus Christ into the world to suffer on your behalf. It's the grace of God that uh, has your name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, never to be erased, never to disappear. It's the grace of God that gives you a mansion 
uh, reserved for you. You've never seen it. You don't know exactly what it will uh, include, but it's reserved for you nevertheless. It's the grace of God that promises to give you a brand new body like the glorified, risen, resurrected Savior one day when this life is over. It's the grace of God that uh, gives you things you don't deserve. And it's someone that says the mercy of God that keeps God from giving you what you do deserve. That's right. So grace and mercy are both coupled. And it's the grace of God that, uh, that establishes a new Christian. He suddenly, um, and Brother Manuel is probably a good one to give us a testimony on this same idea. But suddenly, that new Christian loves God in a way he never loved him before. And he's grateful for the, the knowledge that keeps coming to him as he reads his Bible, of what God has done for him, how God meets his needs, how God answers his prayers, how God has communion and fellowship with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's never a busy signal when you talk to the Lord, right? And um, as we, the song we sang earlier, a sweeter as the years go by. Yeah. It's sweeter every day. Amen. As if, if you're looking for it to be sweet, if you're looking for it to be sweeter each day, it will be. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you look for it to be dry and stale and boring, it will be. You get out of the things of God what you put into the things of God, like so many other uh, elements of life. But... A brand new Christian doesn't need to worry how Cain was conceived, right? He doesn't need to worry about whether Adam's uh, human-based circulatory system became a blood-based circulatory system when he sinned. He doesn't need to try to reconcile God's foreknowledge with the doctrine of predestination, how those things can be reconciled with each other. Verse 14 says, Those who by reason of use, using the word of God, like those who, who useth milk, verse 13, that's the exercise that develops a mature Christian to where he can then begin to discern both good <coughs> and evil. The oracles mentioned in verse 12 are like those given to the Jews and described for Paul, by Paul back in Romans 3. So let me have you run back to Romans 3 one more time. Romans 3, verses 1 through 4. Romans 3, verses 1 through 4. What advantage, then, hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Didn't Ecclesiastes 8.4 say, Where the word of a king is, there is power, and who may say unto him, What doest thou? You can't second-guess God or judge God or accuse God of wrongdoing. But uh, the word of God will be true, and it will endure forever, whether you believe it or not. Amen. Whether you accept it or not, whether you receive it to be the true words of God uh, printed in a book that you have access to or not. Uh, it will be the words of God, and it doesn't depend upon your, your belief in them. But you can't believe them or reject them unless you first have them, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can't reject them or believe them unless you first have them. And so this is why the, the, the doctrine of the, or the, uh, the subject of the King James Bible is so important to us because we believe it's the words of God printed in a book exactly as God wants us to see them, to read them, to memorize them, to know them, and to study them. Amen. 
without need for any correction, modification, update, uh, clarification, new punctuation, new spelling, new vocabulary, without needing any of those things. As I've said many times, my job is not to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. Amen. Yeah. And so you cannot believe them or reject them unless you first have them. And in that sense, the oracles are a reference to the scriptures and the commandments God gave to the nation of Israel. They had the words of God. They had the oracles of God. They had God communicating with them uh, directly through Moses and uh, Joshua, and then by the, the prophets later on, by King David and other kings that succeeded him, who were righteous with God. You know, it's funny how when the kingdom of Israel split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, Judah's uh, succession of kings went up, and then the next one went down, and go up, yeah. and go down. They go down again, and have one go up again. There are good ones and bad ones. There was never a good king in the kingdom of Israel. Yeah. They all went, Psh, yeah. all of them were bad. Because they were in rebellion from the start. They were in rebellion against the king, the descendants of David, in Judah. And they set up false idols to offer false sacrifices, ordained false priests that were not among the Levites. And uh, there's not a way in the world God would get involved in that mess. That's why I despise Roman Catholicism so much. Those are not real ministers of the gospel. They don't know whether they're saved or lost. They don't know which direction they're going in. It's all theatrics, it's all costume, it's all drama, it's a robe, that's the costume, it's the missal, that's the script, it's the candles and the incense and the statues, those are the props, it's the altar boys, those are the extras, uh, right? It's, it's theatrics, they process in from the back of the church all the way up to the altar and then they bow in unison like the, right, those old uh, clips of the Beatles, really, Fab Four, Beyond that's what they look like. Bowing towards, the, bowing towards the crucifix up front. It's all theatrics. And um, it's to make you think some big spiritual thing is going on. Nothing's going on. But people are deceived by it. They're not real ministers of the gospel. They don't know Jesus Christ. And the Catholic Church certainly doesn't preach any sound doctrine. They don't preach that a man must be born again. Right. If they do, they have some spin on it that means uh, being baptized in their church. Salvation comes through uh, water baptism. As an infant, they were into it. It's kind of a, a, a multiple stage salvation. You enter into the church when you're baptized as an infant. That, that's not the same as salvation. You receive forgiveness of your sins when you confess, or old enough to make a confession to the priest. But that's not salvation. You receive the life of Christ, whatever that, however that's defined, by eating the, the wafer and the wine. But that's not salvation. And all of these little things, all of these sacraments, the seven sacraments in the Catholic uh, paradigm, and not a single one of them offers eternal salvation. Anointing of the sick, I had a priest anoint me with oil for the sick last year because he and I had cancer, and um, he was very sympathetic. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't. It happened. He was offering so quickly, I didn't have time to refuse and argue with him. I said okay, so we went to church. He anointed me with his oil, and said a little prayer over me. And then he sits down on the on the pew of the church, and he says, "Now you pray for me." So I had a chance to witness to him, tell him how I was saved as a young boy. And I prayed for him that God would open uh, his eyes and you know, reveal himself to him in a real uh, powerful way. Of course, I meant salvation. I don't know however he took it. He can take it however he wants to take it. That's what I meant. But you never know uh, the door God might open if you just, you know, you're kind of winging it, flying by the seat of your pants at the moment. And um, I've had Buddhists offer to pray for me because they knew I was sick. Catholic priest. I was on the, the prayer list of sick people in at least two Catholic churches in the area for a couple of months. 
And uh, and a Mormon bishop asked if I had a Mormon blessing. No, that's okay. <laughs> I don't need your Mormon blessing. I like to mess with the Mormons. I wear a, a V-neck t-shirt, which sort of approximates their just special like underwear. It. Just like it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, keep a clean haircut. And I don't smoke. I don't drink. I, I don't use profanity. And um, you see, if you look like that and you sort of behave like that, you're clean, decent. You know, you might not be riding a bicycle, but you're, you're clean, decent. You have disarmed the Mormon. The Mormon believes that by virtue of his outward appearance, he's clean, neat, sober, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, all of these things. That proves that his faith is better than yours. And when you live that way, as a visibly live that way as a Christian, you have disarmed him. You've taken one of the major weapons he has away from him. He's got nothing left. They don't teach their people to memorize scripture. All you have to do is throw out a few verses and cite the chapter in verse, and uh, you, get, you make their head spin. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. But the oracles are a reference to the scriptures and the commandments uh, that were given to Israel, given by God. Not a reference to the long lost original manuscripts, which no one's ever found. Not a reference to the collective opinions of the so-called scholars. Remember several weeks back I preached about the King James Bible and uh, the word scholar is found twice in your Bible. And in both cases it refers to a student. So the true definition of scholar means a student. And if you're a student of your Bible, you're a scholar. But um, it refers to the book and to the words you have direct access to. And some people believe it. Some people actually will conclude with one verse. Go back to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, this verse nearly sums up the entire Bible. And we'll close right here. Acts chapter 28, verse 24. And some believed the things which were spoken, mm -hmm. and some believed not. Mm -hmm. That verse pretty much summarizes the whole Bible mm -hmm. and all the human race. Um, but the section we're in right now part of the general epistles, which primarily are aimed at giving instructions to Jews or to anyone left behind after the rapture of the church. We try to extract out of him a devotional application, things that can help us <laughs> grow and live as believers now, but don't directly, they're not directly intended for us to have to obey in order to make sure we endure to the end and, and not take the mark of the beast and make it to the other end of the tribulation. I'm not planning to be here during that time. Amen. But we, we look into those books in the New Testament, the last nine books of the New Testament, in, the, in a similar way that we go to the Old Testament and, and extract out of them things that can inspire us and help us to grow as believers now. 